Welcome to part two of my mini ITX HTPC building video. This time I'm going to be putting together the motherboard, putting in the CPU, the cooler, the RAM and the M2 drive. Time to look at the motherboard, a Republic of Gamers Strix X570i gaming board. Firstly, you'll notice I'm wearing an anti-static wrist wrap attached to a grounded piece of metal like my case and have replaced my mouse mat with an anti-static mat just to be safe. I'm also going to be working on the anti-static bag that my motherboard came in, but in absence of that, you can use your motherboard box as well. All right, now let's take a look at the AM4 socket here. Like most third gen Ryzen boards, this motherboard is also compatible with second gen Ryzen chips. It's also capable of handling a chip with up to 16 cores, but we won't be going that crazy today. Next, we've got three fan headers, with one specifically dedicated for all-in-one coolers, but I won't be using one of those today either. You've also got a couple of RGB headers so we can control the lighting on our case via the software the motherboard comes with. Here you can see the USB 3 and USB 2 connectors for the case, as well as two of the four SATA plugs for hard drives. And here's a better look at the two dual channel RAM slots, which can support DDR4 sticks up to 4800 MHz, overclocked of course. Now the main reason I bought this board was for the PCI Express 4 port for future proofing graphics cards. The GPU I'm going to be installing isn't PCI Express 4 compatible, but having the slot now means I won't have to upgrade the whole motherboard in the future when I do upgrade to a compatible video card. We've also got the first of two M2 slots underneath its own dedicated heatsink there, the second of which is underneath the board. Now let's take a look at the back panel I.O. Here you can see the HDMI 2 and display ports 1.4 ports. 4 USB 3.2 Gen 1 in blue and 4 USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports in orange, three of which are Type A and one which is Type C. You've also got Gigabit LAN, Bluetooth 5 and Wi-Fi 6, as well as three Illuminator LED 3.5mm ports for the Supreme FX S1220 HD audio codec. Oh, that's a mouthful. Another good reason to look at this board is for the active VRM or voltage regulator module cooling, which is especially important if you want to overclock and heat sinks which manage to send the heat from all the components mentioned into two 30mm fans. Of course, all this extra cooling comes at a cost, because there's no way to control the CPU or VRM fans, and no power reset button, post display or CMOS switch, which for a board built for enthusiasts and overclocking is a strange emittance. However, since I'm not going to be overclocking, it's not a deal breaker for me. Alright, now let's take a look at our CPU, the immensely popular AMD Ryzen 5 3600, with a base clock of 3.8GHz, overclockable to 4.4GHz. It is built on a 7 nanometer process, and has a total of 6 cores and 12 threads. And just as a side note, unlike Intel chips, the pins are located on the CPU itself, so you will have to be careful when handling the CPU, so you don't bend any of the pins. It's pretty easy to install the chip, just lift up the lever there out from under the catch. And when it comes to installing the CPU, it's a bit hard to see here, but look for the small arrow on one corner of the CPU so you know which way to install it correctly. Then line up the arrow with the corresponding mark on the board, again it's a bit hard to see here, and just drop the CPU into place. You shouldn't need to apply any pressure as that might bend the pins, so just give it a bit of a wiggle to make sure it's solid. After making sure the CPU is installed correctly, simply lower the lever and secure it under the catch. This one here is the uh, Wraith Spire that comes with the 3600 chip that we're using. Now I used stock Intel coolers for 20 years without problems and the AMD coolers that come with the Gear chips are much better than what those were. But these days, now that I know better, it's probably best to go out and buy a third party cooler. This is the Noctua NH-L9i cooler for AM4 sockets. FYI, there is a black version of this fan, but as the backplate is designed for Intel boards and is pretty much impossible to remove without threading the screws, I'd stick with this one which actually comes with the AM4 mount already installed. To install the new cooler, unscrew the existing cooler mounts on the board as they're only for the stock AMD cooler that came with the CPU. Once the stock cooler mounts are removed, the board's existing backplate should just fall out, and look, there you can see the second M2 mount right under the board there. Replace the old backplate with the new one provided in the CPU cooler box, and then put the screws in the holes ready to be screwed into the cooler. They won't be secure though, until you install the cooler on the other side. Now when it comes to applying thermal paste, you don't need to put on a whole lot, because that will obviously reduce its effectiveness. A lot of the stock coolers already come with thermal paste applied, but if you get an aftermarket one, it'll usually come with a little tube to put on it 
or you need to buy it separately. Now, depending on what AMD chip you have, there are different ways you can apply thermal paste. Now you can just put a small pea-sized dot in the center of the chip, or for the kind of AMD CPU that I have, a small line like this is also recommended. And the weight of the CPU cooler on top of that should help spread the thermal paste to cover the entire chip. Once that's done, line the mounting holes on the cooler with the screws we placed through earlier and screw the cooler in place. Now this particular cooler also comes with a low noise adapter cable. I'm not too sure how effective it is, but you can place it on the end of the fan cable and plug it into the CPU header on the board if you like. Now to install the M2 drive. On this board there's a heatsink covering the M2 port, so we need to unscrew it first before we can install the drive. Once it's unscrewed, lift the heatsink off and you'll see it's got some double sided sticky tape on the other side which will help hold the M2 drive in place, but let's put that aside for now. The M2 drive I'll be installing today is a Samsung 970 EVO Plus 500GB NVMe drive. Tried saying that 10 times fast. There are many different types of M2 drives, but if you want the fastest at the moment, make sure it specifically says NVMe on the package. This one has write speeds of up to 3200MB a second and read speeds of up to 3500MB a second. Insert the M2 drive into the slot, making sure it lines up with the screw hole nice and flat without bowing or being on an angle. Then just screw it into place. Now place the M2 heatsink back, making sure to remove the cover covering the sticky tape that will help hold the M2 drive in place. Once that's off, just screw the heatsink back into place. Installing the RAM is pretty easy. I've got a matched pair of G-Skill DDR4 3200 sticks. In an ITX board there's only two RAM slots, so there's no doubt in which slots you need to put it in. They only go in one way, so just line up the little notches in the RAM sticks with those on the board, and make sure you pull back the release tabs on the side of each slot on the board. The release tabs should click back into place when the RAM stick is in properly, but don't force them in if they're not. Alright, now that the motherboard's good to go, it's time to see if it fits in our mini ITX case. For that, check out the video I made on the Silverstone RVZ03 mini ITX case. Until next time, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.